Welcome to this session on appeals, dissents, and judicial reviews. Let me introduce you to the uh, panel chair who will introduce his uh, co-panelists. John Warren McDougall is an independent arbitrator associated with Arbitration Place in Toronto and three Valerum buildings in London. Uh, he is a QC, a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, and as I said, associated with uh, Arbitration Place. His practice has encompassed almost all aspects of corporate and commercial dispute resolution. He's appeared in a wide variety of complex cases in the courts and in arbitration. He has particular experience in securities, competition and energy related matters, class actions and insolvency, as well as extensive experience in cross-border cases involving multinational clients. He has sat as an arbitrator since 1990. Welcome and thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim, very much for that introduction. And I'm going to do the same and introduce the panel for you. Uh, I'll be somewhat less formal. Uh, I'll do it alphabetically, the first being Robert Patrick Armstrong, who's sitting in the middle to my right. We first met when we were at Carleton University playing football for a terrible team. Uh, and was, that's all right, because we were terrible football players. He went on from uh, Carleton to the University of Toronto, uh, where he took a, a master's degree in political science. He had the good fortune to meet uh, the late Chief Justice Bor Alaskan, who persuaded him he was on the wrong course and got him to uh, enter law school, uh, which was a great favor to the, us and the profession. Uh, he, when he graduated from, uh, from law school, he joined uh, Charles Dubbin's firm, later to be Chief Justice of Ontario, and, and a group of uh, litigators which formed uh, Mr. Dubbin's firm. All of them moved to Tories, uh, where Bob ended up leading a, what is fairly called and remains a powerhouse litigation department. He was elected a bencher of the Law Society and ultimately became treasurer of the Law Society of Upper Canada. And having left that, he waited for a decent interval, and he then, then was di directly appointed to the Court of Appeal for Ontario, where he sat for 11 years, retiring in 2013. Uh, he's now at arbitration place, uh, doing primarily arbitrations, although some mediation. Uh, and. Uh, I, I enjoy the, uh, the, the fact that he's in the next office to me. Ian Binney, uh, William Ian Cornell Binney, uh, when Bob Armstrong was starting law school, he was at Cambridge uh, reading law. He distinguished himself there by being elected the first Canadian president of the Cambridge Union. He joined Bob at, uh, at uh, U of T in second year law school. And on graduation, he joined McKinnon and McTaggart, uh, a firm no longer sadly with us, but was a powerhouse, to use the word again, a litigation force in Toronto. He joined the Department of Justice in Ottawa and quickly became leading counsel for the federal government, ultimately as well becoming Deputy Minister of Justice. He returned to Toronto and joined McCarthy's and spent a number of years there before he was plucked from the bar by the government and appointed directly to the Supreme Court of Canada, where he spent 14 most distinguished years. He returned, uh, he retired several years ago and quickly uh, rose to the top of the uh, international and domestic arbitration world. And he also has uh, a place in three Verulam buildings in London, as well as being a member of our arbitration place. Third but not last is uh, Bill Horton. Uh, I was sitting in the Court of Appeal many years ago uh, and a young counsel was on the case ahead of me and I was sort of listening as one does in a kind of desultory way and I was startled by the diction, the voice, and the presentation of counsel, and he had the court transfixed. 
which if you knew the Court of Appeal in those days, it was a very difficult thing to do. That was, of course, he won, of course. That was, of course, as well, uh, Bill Horton, and that's when I first met him. He was at McMill and Bench, uh, and he had a peripatetic career opening a, 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 a boutique with uh, John Laskin, and then uh, going from there, uh, ultimately, to Blake's, where he was a mainstay of the litigation group. Uh, throughout his career, he's had a, 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 an intense interest in ADR and all forms, but particularly arbitration. Uh, he uh, has sat on many important arbitrations, but he also writes, speaks, and teaches uh, in the field. He truly does it all. Uh, now, that's your, your panel. Uh, let me say a, a few words, and I do mean a few words by way of introduction. Uh, as you know, the, the title of the, uh, of the panel's, uh, or the focus is dissents, judicial review, and appeals. So really three topics. I want to explain why we chose the, uh, the topics. We wanted to uh, discuss the general subject of tensions between the judicial and arbitration systems, uh, courts and judges against arbitration. Secondly, we wanted to focus on those aspects of arbitration which are areas which are most in contact with the judicial system, and that obviously includes the three topics that form the title of the panel. And our panel, it may be obvious, is uniquely, almost uniquely qualified to opine on this subject. Uh, in Ian and Bob's case, they, they have moved from two of the highest courts in the country to the world of arbitration and have or are making uh, adjustments uh, to the new system. And I hope that we'll hear something from them about that topic and what they perceive the, the different skill sets, if any, that are needed in the arbitration world. In Bill's case, as I said, he's been a very keen observer and scholar in, in the arbitration world for a number of years. And I have to say this about him, he has a very strong and sometimes untraditional views uh, about arbitration. I, I expect you will hear uh, more about that, and I know you will because I read his paper last night uh, and uh, the views are all there. Um, there's an immediacy to the topic uh, of the relationship between private dispute resolution and the public court system. We all know about the controversies ongoing as I speak in Europe about uh, the uh, CETA, uh, the trade agreement. Uh, we know about the American elections uh, position by both candidates uh, against uh, the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the TTIP. And it, it, it's all centered uh, on the basic issue, it seems to me, that whether arbitrators owe any duties uh, with respect to public interests affected by their arbitration. Uh, can, and the question, of course, is can they owe any such duties when they're the creature of private parties uh, with no, uh, no other master or mistress than the parties to the contract? That's the question. In recent times, uh, and this is the second arm of it, uh, and you will hear about this, uh, more about this from at least two of the panelists, there's a, an expression of concern by some courts and some judges about the growth of arbitration. Uh, and the concern is that, that both that the courts are losing good cases to the arbitration world and, and that the law is not being developed, an issue. And again, we may hear something about it. The present debate uh, is between, or exemplified by the debate between Lord Mance and Lord Thomas in England, one saying that the, uh, there should be more judicial control of arbitration uh, and the, the act, Arbitration Act should be amended. The other saying uh, party autonomy, autonomy prevails and it 
it is a standalone system. So the question is, uh, the core issue is, is it an independent system or is it a quasi-judicial system or possibly a bit of both? Now, finally, we won't solve all the, those issues in the next hour or so, but this hour has 20 minutes. Uh, and each of the three topics will be dealt with by pre presentation by one of the speakers for about 10 minutes. He will be followed by one of our number who has been assigned, <coughs> excuse me, assigned the, uh, <coughs> the job of first commentator. The rest of the panel uh, will comment as well, uh, or may. And then we will invite a question or two uh, from uh, the uh, from the audience, if anybody is minded to give us a short uh, view or intervention. I will be rigorous about the 20 minute limit so we get, we cover it all within the allotted time. So uh, the first subject, which is uh, the mandate of, uh, of Ian Binney, is uh, dissents in arbitration. Ian. Well, thank you, uh, John, and uh, it's a uh, pleasure to uh, rise in support of uh, dissents, as uh, <laughs> I think uh, dissents are by far the most uh, uh, rewarding and uh, uh, the cheerful side of uh, judging, uh, especially in a court where the uh, fight takes place in the open and is uh, written up in various uh, law journals. Uh, and you have, of course, uh, the Claire Laure du Bay approach of uh, history will vindicate me. And of course, all dissenters uh, believe uh, that someday they will prevail. And they'll say, Mr. Justice Armstrong saw the truth 20 years ago, and now it is uh, uh, the law. Uh, there isn't that satisfaction in uh, uh, either domestic or international arbitration because uh, uh, you're sort of crying in the wilderness because nobody hears you. Uh, the proceedings are confidential as are the uh, awards. So there has to be other uh, reasons uh, than appealing uh, to history. Uh, there is a difference between uh, the domestic uh, arbitrations and international in the sense that many of the international uh, fora uh, uh, publish awards. Uh, there's a huge body of jurisprudence, for example, in uh, investor state uh, disputes. Uh, there's a considerable amount of uh, publicity attending uh, ICC uh, uh, awards. Uh, particularly if there uh, are annulment uh, uh, proceedings. So the notion that uh, nobody will hear you if uh, you dissent is not quite uh, uh, correct. Uh, uh, decisions of arbitrators like Yves Fortier and uh, Marc Lalonde, Henry Alvarez and a number of other uh, Canadians are very well uh, known and understood uh, internationally. But uh, having said that, uh, uh, while the dissent is not uh, uh, entirely useless in arbitration, uh, it is frowned upon. Uh, there is a, a very strong institutional push uh, to achieve unanimity. And it's considered uh, particularly tasteless uh, to dissent in favor of the party who appointed you uh, but on the other hand, it would be rather unusual to dissent in favor of the other side. And what uh, takes over, I think, particularly in international arbitration, which is confined to a relatively small group of people uh, in which Canada should be much better uh, represented uh, than it is, uh, there is a sense of professionalism and uh, earning the respect of uh, other arbitrators. And if you become known as a toady for the party who appointed you, uh, it is uh, quickly understood that you are not going to be an effective appointee uh, because the other two aren't going to listen to you because uh, 
you're in the uh, tradition of a labor uh, sides person who is appointed for the union or management is not expected to uh, toll the, uh, the party line. A dissent uh, internationally at least has been held by some courts, uh, most recently uh, in Switzerland. Dissents aren't even part of the award. It's simply a, a, a letter to posterity uh, that you don't agree uh, with the result. Uh, I think it's important uh, not to weaken the authority of an award unless you actually have something important to say. Uh, there's not much point in grandstanding in arbitration as there is, it is said, uh, in some courts. I'm not singling out the Ontario Court of Appeal, but it's... Uh, <laughs> uh, if, if the tribunals, you know, in these international awards are seen as, as, as quarrelsome and uh, concurring and dissenting uh, judgments, it really uh, weakens the whole foundation uh, of the credibility of the, of the institution. Having said that, uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, a dissent which had a billion dollar uh, impact. It was a, a, a case in the ICC, uh, Occidental Petroleum, um, against Ecuador. It had to do with uh, oil concessions, exploration in uh, uh, Ecuador. Uh, and as is often the case in these uh, awards, uh, once something of value is achieved by the uh, investor, uh, the government is accused of moving in, shouldering out the foreign investor, and taking over the benefit uh, of the investment, and that was the accusation in this case. Uh, and in fact, uh, on the merits, uh, that accusation was upheld. But there was a complication because Occidental Petroleum had farmed out 40% of its stake to a um, Chinese company. And uh, the majority of the arbitral panel awarded 100% of this $2 billion uh, award, uh, compensation claim uh, to Occidental Petroleum. And the dissent said uh, that can't possibly be correct. Occidental Petroleum only had 60% of the uh, uh, investment after the farm out. And then they got into a dispute as to the validity of the farm out agreement and the majority said uh, it was invalid under the applicable law which was New York uh, law. The dissent uh, written by the appointee of Ecuador who has often been on these panels for Ecuador uh, but is a brilliant woman from the uh, Sorbonne, uh, uh, said uh, that uh, the agreement is valid until it is avoided. And therefore, this farm out agreement, until set aside by a New York court, was valid to uh, relieve Occidental Petroleum of 40% of its stake. Therefore, the damages should be reduced by 40% with which a, a number of other adjustments uh, cut a $2 billion award uh, back to uh, uh, $1 billion. So uh, a worthwhile uh, uh, dissent. Uh, her uh, uh, dissent really is a masterpiece in uh, European uh, diplomacy, all beautifully uh, framed and how respectful she was of the majority and what a wonderful job they'd done on the facts. and. There were these few legal points which they had totally misunderstood and she felt conscience bound to point that out. Uh, and uh, all of those points, bang, 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 were accepted by the annulment panel. And the twist is that the farm out agreement to the Chinese party was beyond the jurisdiction of the arbitral tribunal because there was no investment treaty between China and Ecuador. So the dissent said, well, this is tough. You know, it is a billion dollar windfall for Ecuador. Maybe they should have a, China, a trade agreement with uh, uh, China, uh, but they don't. Uh, uh, so there are jurisdictional disputes within legal disputes within overall 
uh, factual disputes uh, that become quite complicated, and in that uh, case, well, it seems to me the, the, uh, the dissent uh, was not only quite legitimate, uh, but quite um, uh, appropriate. I'll just say uh, a couple of other things on uh, dissents. Uh, I uh, am in favor of uh, uh, dissents on an important point uh, for a number of reasons. One is that it forces the majority to clarify its reasons. Uh, if a dissent comes in and says, I don't agree with this, 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 and this, the majority have an opportunity to go back to their reasons and say, well, you know, there's some, some merit in the point. It doesn't change the result, but I better do some rewriting to cover off these points, and it, it results in a much stronger uh, uh, judgment. The other uh, uh, advantage uh, to me as counsel was always, I look at the dissent for a uh, uh, an accurate statement of what the majority decided. So that instead of my saying the result of the majority is this, I've got the dissenting judge or arbitrator uh, making that point. Uh, the second uh, uh, of my three small points uh, is the, uh, uh, you know, a repugnance of signing on to a judgment you simply cannot endorse. I mean, you, you, you th look at the majority judgment, as indeed in this Occidental Petroleum case, and you say, you know, the, the, the majority has gone off the rails. I'm pointing it out. If they want to change and come on side with my view, that's great. Then we'll all be together on a single uh, judgment. If they don't change, I'm simply not prepared to associate myself with legal reasoning, which is uh, uh, defective. And the final reason uh, is the feel-good factor. There's something really satisfying about looking at a majority judgment and saying, nonsense, and uh, releasing it to the world. Thank you. Bill Horton has been, Bill Horton has been assigned uh, to comment on the first on Ian's presentation. not working. Um, I concur. Um, Chicken. Now, <laughs> now uh, following the example of the Supreme Court of Canada, I'm going to muddy the waters with some concurring reasons. Um, uh, the, uh, I just want to comment, first of all, on dissents in favor of the party that appointed you which is almost universally the case. I mean, if there's a dissent, it's in favor of the party that appointed the dissenter. Uh, I wouldn't, though, draw the conclusion that that is the only kind of dissent that occurs, because I have a feeling that it's only when you're dissenting in favor of the party that appointed you that you have an incentive to make your dissent known, whereas there can be dissenters in favor of the party that didn't appoint you who don't necessarily want to publicize the fact and so those are buried in the um, those are buried in the unanimous decisions. So I just I just point out that the appearances are not always the complete reality. Um, <clears throat> the um, other thing I, I just point out is that it may seem like an easy choice for a party appointee to dissent, but it is not in fact an easy choice to dissent if you think about it, because. Um, if you um, go along with the majority point of view, you may be excused by the party who appointed you. Well, he is just following his principle. He's, he's a person of integrity or she's a person of integrity and was persuaded. Whereas if you dissent, you're advertising the fact that you were unable to persuade the others of your point of view. And uh, particularly, if, if your reasons are strong, why did you fail? And if your reasons are weak, then it just proves that you made the effort to persuade the majority to weak reasons. So it's not necessarily a great publicity bonanza to dissent. Uh, I just would say, say that that's uh, something that people should keep in mind. Dissents are uh, really a tool uh, that is extremely useful in the arbitration process uh, in, many, in many ways. 
And I think of the ways that dissents arise. Um, for example, uh, and you mentioned uh, one of them, which is uh, improving the majority decision. Well, that's true if you have a principled dissent. Uh, and if I'm chairing a tribunal and there's a principled dissent, I say, wonderful. Now we're going to have a chance to really hone our reasoning on both sides. If it's an unprincipled dissent, the fact that a dissent is possible really empowers the chair to move the process along much more quickly. Uh, for example, uh, in one international arbitration I was sitting on, um, the uh, other party appointee said something like, uh, after very partisan engagement in, uh, uh, in the deliberations, said, well, I tell you what, uh, just keep the damages under $10 billion and I won't dissent. So you get into this kind of horse trading, partisan behavior. And then it's very easy for the chair to say, well, you know what? The majority decision is going to be ready in 48 hours. You can add your dissent or not as you, as you see fit. So it actually helps you to move that process along uh, and uh, exclude the dissenter once it's apparent that uh, the position is going to be a partisan position. Um, I only dissented once. Um, and it was in favor of the party that appointed me. And it was for the reasons that I just, there were two issues, one was jurisdiction. I just did not feel that I, want, that I could be professionally associated with the analysis of the majority on jurisdiction, which is a, a matter on which I'm very often engaged uh, in, other, in virtually all arbitrations. So it was an important point professionally to me not to be associated with that line of thinking. And I happen to also think that there was a miscarriage of justice with respect to the, um, the, the findings of, of fact, which I, I couldn't support. There was one other situation in which um, I, would, I was considering dissenting because my mind wasn't made up. But unfortunately, I was the chair of the tribunal. So I would have to dissent uh, as chair, which would be a very rare thing. It ended up that I was persuaded by the other two, that they were right. And I went, Shamed. And I went, <laughs> and I, and I, and I went along. Uh, and then there's a third, this will be the last comment, uh, JL. Um, uh, a third situation, which was a procedural matter, uh, I felt strongly that the majority was wrong. I decided that it, I shouldn't dissent on a procedural matter. And I have to say, I've regretted it ever since. <laughs> I really wish I had dissented. Um, and that comes back to your other point about the feel-good factor, perhaps. Uh, but also, I think in that case, there was a little bit of this, what is your philosophy of arbitration? And that's what you're putting out there. And if you're making individual decisions that are inconsistent with that, um, it, it becomes very uncomfortable. So I think dissents are a very useful tool. Do you have a comment on that? <clears throat> if not, if, if not I, I have a question for you, yeah. And that is that it is said, or they say, that whoever they may be, that an arbitrator has a duty uh, when considering whether or not to dissent to lean where there's no appeal, to, to lean in favor of not dissenting in order to support the, the arbitration award and, in some cases, the enforceability of the award. What's your view on that? Well, I, I, I don't think uh, that there is an obligation on the uh, arbitrator uh, to institutional solidarity that is higher uh, than the issues of principle that uh, Bill and I have uh, uh, touched on. Uh, clearly, uh, there is, as I mentioned, there is an institutional pressure to try to get uh, unanimous awards. What we're talking about are exceptions uh, to that. What what values override that default position where you're trying for a unanimous award? Um, any comment, Bob? No. Uh, is is there any question from or comment from the audience? Yes. I, I 
Well, I think uh, it is a problem. Uh, I think, uh, at least in theory, uh, three people arguing out uh, uh, an important point of law, uh, single individual, all things being uh, uh, equal. I think that the Labour Relations Board, as it used to be, I don't know how it is now, I mean, it was that you were really only addressing the chair, uh, because whoever, the, whichever way the chair uh, uh, elsewhere, so it was almost a, a useless exercise and you did not get the benefit of if you have experienced wing persons, uh, they can contribute uh, to the debate and point out what can be said on behalf of the party that uh, that appointed them, but but it's a very expensive solution to have three people sitting where, in effect, uh, one can do. And it, very often, I think, in labor relations, it's the finality of the decision that's important. You know, you've got to have a decision, and it's probably more important to get finality than to ultimately to get it right. Um, I'll add a few comments. Uh, there are many uh, situations in commercial arbitration worth tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. I know of one case where the amount in issue was a billion dollars decided by sole arbitrator. Uh, and it is a reflection of the confidence that the parties have in their choice of arbitrator as to whether or not that's a good thing to do. Uh, I can tell you that I have been involved in arbitrations as a party appointee, where once the chair was appointed, uh, I have suggested, in some cases, to the parties, which the rest of the tribunal doesn't necessarily appreciate, well, now that we have a really good chair, what do you need the two wingers for? Because it, the, the matter doesn't support the having three people. Bear in mind, three people is going to cost you more than three times what one person costs you. The procedure becomes so much more complicated with the schedules. Delay is inevitable. Managing the procedure with three people's different ideas about how the procedure should be managed can become very problematic. So um, I just strongly encourage people to think about sole arbitrator whenever they can and to go with three when there are some very, very specific insurmountable reasons that justify all the cost. And there are those cases, of course. Of course there are those cases. Um, but uh, they are rare in, in my experience. Can, can I just comment on the, the, the comment? Because uh, uh, one of the big uh, uh, areas of reluctance of general counsel to go to arbitration mm -hmm. is they're concerned about wearing the blame if the whole thing blows mm -hmm. up in the face of their client. Uh, and if they go to the courts, not only is there an appeal, but they say, well, we drew a dumb judge, it's the system, you know, it's sad, but that's the way it is, right? You choose an arbitrator, uh, and you wear it if, if that case uh, goes badly. Uh, there is no judge uh, so brilliant as uh, does not have an off day, you know, uh, and I'm not going to name names on this panel. Uh, you know, but the fact is that uh, you're putting all your eggs in that one basket. You've got very circumscribed rights of appeal. Uh, so, you know, Bill is quite right. If you get a first-class arbitrator, there are many advantages of going there. But for the, uh, the general counsel who's steering the dispute in that direction, there's a big risk. Well, you know... One thing, we may come back to this on the appeal topic. Uh, one thing we generally don't have to worry about is the general, uh, general counsel of big corporations. Uh, they have uh, a lot of control over what the dispute resolution process looks like in the agreements that they enter into. Uh, and yes, they can agree to litigation with exclusive jurisdiction clauses. We now have uh, a New Hague Treaty on Choice of Court, which makes that more viable. Uh, they can, in most provinces, provide for a right of appeal. They can specify a three-person tribunal. Uh, we don't need to worry about changing the system for everyone based on the people who have the greatest influence over what uh, dispute resolution clauses and processes should look like. Uh, what we should do is have a process that works for everybody, 
and then let people adjust it for the particular situations that arise. That's my view. I just like to. I just comment briefly. Uh, it's a take coming out of your time. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, one of the criticisms I hear and I've heard uh, when I was on the court, heard when I was in practice, I hear, still here now, is that these arbitration clauses are often the last thing that is drawn in a serious commercial agreement. It's kind of an afterthought. Oh my God, we've got the deal done. Uh, what are we going to do about an arbitration clause? And some corporate lawyer goes back to his office and says, this looks pretty good. When the litigators eventually get hold of it, they say, my God, uh, what have we got here? A dog's breakfast. So uh, you're looking at much more sophisticated arbitration clauses than I've seen. Well, I don't know. I've done about uh, 120 arbitrations. Most of them have been a sole arbitrator. This uh, mythology of the pathological arbitration clause, uh, you know, I, I haven't seen it very much. Can I just uh, stop here? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You want to move to another topic? I have to move to another topic. <laughs> uh, the, the next topic, of course, as you will have inferred, is, is uh, Bob Armstrong on judicial review. Well, first of all, I uh, want to thank my old friend and teammate at uh, Carleton for that, uh, what Ian said was an over-the-top introduction. Uh, <laughs> quite frankly, the, the, the only thing I really agreed uh, with was uh, uh, the fact that uh, our team, except for McDougall, was full of terrible football players and I was one of them. Um, that said, uh, I want to deal with the subject of uh, judicial review on two levels. First of all, uh, what the Ontario Act uh, says about uh, judicial review, and secondly, uh, to talk about a recent case uh, that was subject to uh, judicial review in respect of the award being attacked on the basis uh, of uh, lack of impartiality of the arbitrator chosen, which was discovered after the fact, as it were. So um, Michael Huang, uh, senior counsel, Singapore, uh, chambers in London, and one of the leading international arbitrators has said, uh, courts should supervise with a light touch, but assist with a strong hand. Sounds a bit like uh, Theodore Roosevelt's uh, foreign policy, which was uh, uh, speak softly and walk with a big stick. Uh, Lord Mance of the uh, Supreme Court uh, of the United Kingdom uh, in a recent com commentary, commentary on uh, Huang's uh, statement said, uh, I think it uh, unwise to expect uh, anything more than uh, what uh, Wang has said. Um, I think it's uh, fairly clear just looking at the jurisprudence uh, and my narrow experience is looking at uh, uh, the Ontario jurisprudence and uh, of course I've read every case of uh, Justice uh, Benny. Uh, but um, l l let me go back to a case in 2005 uh, of the Ontario Court of Appeal and let Justice Benny speak for his own. Uh, cases, uh, a case called United uh, Mexican States and Feldman, uh, where it's a NAFTA uh, investor state uh, arbitration uh, was before uh, the Superior Court then came to the Court of Appeal, uh, and um, the uh, court said uh, briefly, uh, notions of international comity and the reality of a global marketplace suggests that courts should use their authority to interfere with international commercial arbitration awards sparingly. Uh, and in the same case, they uh, cited uh, a pithy statement from uh, Justice Austin, the Court of Appeal judgment back in the middle 90s, uh, and uh, the court made reference to the strong commitment made by the legislature of this province to the policy of international commercial arbitration through the adoption of the ICAA and the model law. 
so I think it is fair to say that the courts generally, at least in Ontario, and I think the Supreme Court of Canada as well, have approved, uh, have approached judicial review of uh, arbitration awards with considerable deference uh, to the arbitrator's award. I think it is fair to say that the Ontario courts have recognized and accepted uh, that the parties have elected to have their disputes resolved by a commercial process, by consensual process that is different from and independent of the judicial system. I think uh, John Lauren McDougall wrote that uh, sentence for me, but uh, he, he's, not, he's got me convinced of it. Um, and um, what clearly has happened is uh, th that uh, sophisticated uh, commercial enterprises have decided to opt out of the court system and the courts, by and large, both uh, internationally and domestically, uh, recognize uh, that this is the new uh, reality. Uh, as to whether or not, when I was uh, at the bar, I went around the province uh, making speeches th that uh, the common law was in fact going to fade away and die uh, because all of these important complex commercial cases uh, were being decided by uh, single arbitrators uh, scattered around uh, the province and elsewhere, uh, and that wasn't a good idea. Uh, now, of course, that I'm on the other side of uh, this argument and earning a living from it uh, somewhat, uh, you can judge whether I've changed my mind or whether I am just uh, catering to my own self-interest. But I, I don't think uh, w what I was saying back in uh, 1997, 98, 99, 2000, uh, really has come to pass. Uh, I, I mean, the, I think the problem with commercial law uh, is that uh, it doesn't very often uh, get developed beyond uh, the, uh, the, the intermediate courts of appeal across the country. Uh, and. Uh, I was always grateful for that when I sat on one of those courts. But, uh, you know, in fairness to the Supreme Court of Canada, you know, look at their recent uh, commercial cases. They are, in fact, granting leave to appeal, perhaps not in as many as they should. But the law of the land still comes uh, from the Supreme Court of Canada. And uh, I don't see any really significant evidence uh, that the sky has fallen so far as the development of the law is concerned. So mo moving briefly uh, to the Ontario Act, they're basically, so far as uh, judicial review is concerned, uh, <coughs> three, four sections. Uh, section 6, Section 17, Section 46, and Section 48. Uh, I'll read only uh, one of them to you. Uh, which is uh, Section uh, 6, and this is what uh, Section 6 says, uh, and the important words are in the first four or five words, no court, no court shall intervene in matters governed by this Act except for the following purposes in accordance with this Act, to assist the conducting of arbitrations, to ensure that arbitrations are conducted in accordance with arbitration agreements, to prevent unequal or unfair treatment of parties uh, to arbitration agreements and to enforce awards. Nothing there about the substantive uh, features of an arbitration award. Uh, I mean, the legislature is just laid off completely. Uh, I'll be interested to hear what Bill has to say in respect of uh, the right of appeal, but the substantive law doesn't seem to be touched by the uh, the uh, sections uh, of the Act uh, related to uh, uh, judicial review. Um, then, uh, Mr. Gay, of course, uh, has recently released a, a book, an annotation of the uh, uh, whole Ontario Act, which is a, really a masterpiece. Ian was at uh, the opening of the uh, Book, the publication of the book uh, a week or so ago. I missed it. I should have gone uh, to hear what he had to say, but no doubt he'll uh, have something further to say uh, about it uh, on this panel. Then uh, Section 17 uh, is, um, I can find it. 
So Section 17, an arbitral tribunal may rule on its own jurisdiction to conduct the arbitration and may in that connection rule on objections in respect to existence or validity of the arbitral agreement. Again, no, nothing about uh, the uh, substance of the arbitration. And then uh, finally, uh, Section 46, on a party's application, the court may set aside an award on any of the following grounds. And there's a list uh, of uh, ten paragraphs which set out the basis upon which uh, you can move to set aside uh, the uh, award <coughs> under the uh, Act. Uh, and uh, again, uh, nothing uh, related uh, to the uh, merits of the case. Um, there was uh, an interesting uh, case that came out uh, of the Ontario courts in January, uh, and uh, it involved, uh, many of you know Tom Heinzman, uh, who uh, was an arbitrator for, uh, or a uh, litigator for some 40 years. McCarthy is one of the leading uh, counsel in uh, Toronto and Ontario and beyond. And uh, he was uh, approached uh, as a, sing a single arbitrator to uh, be appointed as a single arbitrator uh, and agreed, uh, looked at the list of the parties, looked at other information with which he was provided to determine whether or not he had a conflict, and uh, uh, he was satisfied he had no uh, conflict. It, it, uh, it turned out uh, when uh, his award uh, was released, uh, that uh, the uh, losing party went off uh, to a new lawyer to have a look at the case and determine if there's any way to uh, set aside the award, appeal the award, whatever. Uh, and doing that, uh, they discovered that uh, one of the parties, uh, the losing party, uh, had been a client uh, of uh, McCarthy Tetro and had. Uh, done a bit of work uh, for that party, but more particularly had uh, advised uh, the, the uh, financiers uh, in respect of uh, five uh, financial transactions for that party. Uh, and so they uh, challenged the award on the basis of reasonable apprehension of bias. Uh, and uh, the evidence uh, before uh, Justice Mew, who of course uh, is an international arbitrator, was an international arbitrator of uh, some renown, uh, at least in uh, Ontario, has done a number of, uh, of international cases, particularly in the uh, sport world with ICDR. But um, uh, the, um, this, is, uh, this is what the evidence was. Uh, the parties did not dispute that the arbitrator had no knowledge of his former firm's relationship uh, with uh, the uh, financial company and the, uh, and the company that was a party. Uh, the applicant, to, to set aside, said the applicant's evidence is that it became aware of the relationship between McCarthy's Northland and the underwriters on the 16th of November 20, uh, 2014, having engaged new lawyers to consider the merits of challenging the final award, the applicant's discovery of McCarthy's relationship with Northland was described by the applicant's representative, sets it all out, and uh, their position simply was uh, that uh, Heinzman should, he'd left <coughs> McCarthy 11 months before he was appointed to this uh, arbitration. And uh, the uh, evidence uh, was that he did not make uh, any inquiry of McCarthy's uh, by way of a conflict check. Uh, and um, uh, the additional evidence was former lawyers of McCarthy's were not able to serve conflicts of the firm. McCarthy uh, provided that evidence and said that it would be exceedingly rare after a lawyer leaves the firm, that he would check with McCarthy's about a conflict. And, and uh, uh, Did you see it? they uh, said that with respect to McCarthy's representation, uh, the firm acted for Northland once, and that was uh, for 
30-minute docket, oh, and nice. in relation to the uh, financiers, uh, they'd had five uh, different uh, transactions. Uh, uh, Heinzman, of course, knew nothing about it at the time he was at McCarthy's, knew nothing about it after he left McCarthy's. So the question became, in the case, was there an obligation uh, to, um, on, on Heinzman's part, uh, to uh, uh, search, uh, uh, to, to uh, go farther and go to McCarthy's and say, is there a problem? McCarthy said they basically would have told him to buzz off uh, and uh, that uh, it, they were not going to provide information about their clients uh, to somebody who was no longer associated with the firm and was no longer a partner. Uh, and uh, here's what Justice Mew said. Uh, I am aware of no authority which imposes on judges recently appointed or otherwise a duty to ask their former firms to conduct conflict searches for the names of all parties to the cases which the judge deals with. Judges will typically know the clients they acted for and they, uh, when they were lawyers as well as other major clients of their former uh, firms. Uh, as a practical matter, firms such as McCarthy's owe an obligation to their clients and to disclose confidential information to third parties, which would include former partners and lawyers it is presumably for this reason that McCarthy's are rarely asked to conduct conflict searches, et cetera. So, uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, the challenge was lost. What, what is interesting to me about this case being somewhat new uh, to this uh, field of uh, arbitrating uh, is the extent to which uh, some folks may go uh, on the losing side to find a way to challenge when there doesn't appear to be any other way uh, to uh, challenge a, an arbitration award uh, and the extent to which as an arbitrator I have to search my soul and uh, search my uh, available records to, to determine whether or not I have any conflict. I basically see the names on a page uh, and say, well, I have no conflict. Uh, maybe I now have to uh, do more, I don't know. Fortunately, in the circumstances of this case, it was a bit extreme, and Heinzman uh, behaved perfectly uh, properly. Uh, very different uh, from a judge of the court. I mean, if he, Finney, uh, sitting uh, on the Supreme Court of Canada after 30 years in practice, or whatever it was, every time uh, a uh, lawyer popped up uh, uh, who was in his class or a friend or whatever arguing a case before him, uh, he'd have to go to the uh, Chief Justice and uh, say, I'm sorry, I can't sit on this case, uh, and uh, so on. And uh, Roy McMurtry, uh, who was my Chief Justice, uh, he always used to say, if you went to talk to him about, I've got this problem uh, with X as counsel or the possibility that this client, this uh, party, uh, was a client of my former firm. Uh, what I, what should I do about it? Uh, should I make that disclosure by having a clerk uh, call the, the uh, office of the lawyers, offices of the lawyers concerned? Roy's view always was: if you have to disclose it, then don't sit, uh, don't, uh, don't call the parties and 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 say. Uh, I, 15 years ago, did a careless driving case for the son of the president of uh, X or Y or Z. So that was his approach to conflicts. That's it. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Uh, uh, in the interest of time uh, and in order that we hear oh, Bill's presentation on appeals, there's only going to be one comment uh, uh, on Bob's uh, presentation now and we'll save it for the end if there is an end. And um, actually I can do my comment as an intro to my my appeal thing and so we'll save time that way. Go for it. The bridge between um, judicial review and um, arbitration appeals, which is my topic, uh, is this notion, which is fundamental, that 
other than when arbitration is mandated by statute, which is quite a common occurrence, um, arbitration is based on consent. Uh, this, is, uh, this is absolutely fundamental to understand. So when we're talking about set aside, we're talking about, uh, or judicial review, was there consent, uh, and if so, was the arbitration conducted within the bounds of that explicit or implied consent? Um, so if, if, you, uh, if you think of any other favorite consensual activity of yours uh, other than arbitration, uh, you'll readily see that in every form of consensual uh, activity, the courts play a critical role in patrolling the boundaries of consent and patrolling abuses within that consensual activity. And that's essentially what we're talking about in terms of judicial review. Uh, we're not talking about the quality of the activity itself. When we get into appeals, we're now talking about uh, the quality of the activity. Uh, we're talking about, in the context of arbitration, we're talking about the merits and what is the role of the courts, the appropriate role of the courts in substituting its opinion or the opinion of a particular judge or a particular panel uh, for that of the arbitration tribunal. And of course you can subscribe to the view, as some do, uh, and it's quite evident in the case law, that really the only legitimate outcome is one that's blessed by the court. Um, or you could subscribe to the view that, uh, well, whatever is the last outcome must be the right outcome. Uh, and therefore, the more rounds we have of review, the more likely it is that the last outcome will be the correct outcome. Now I suggest to you that if you are of that view, um, you are really should be litigating your cases. Uh, because that's not what arbitration is. Arbitration is something completely different. Unfortunately, um, and uh, uh, we can go into this uh, some other day, um, despite the fact that arbitration has regularly being described both in civil law and common law traditions as being a contractual form of dispute resolution whereby the parties agree to abide by the decision of a chosen arbitrator and have a process that is to the exclusion of the courts. Uh, the, and I don't think we can only blame the courts for this. I think the legal profession itself bears a, a burden of responsibility for simply not wanting to let go of the um, uh, review of arbitral awards on the merits. And how has this expressed itself? It's expressed itself in legis arbitration legislation across Canada, particularly on the non-international side. In the international side, we have the New York Convention that prohibits uh, review of the merits. Um, everyone wants to go along with the international um, uh, regime of arbitration, so there's very little review of the merits unless the arbitral process itself is designed to provide for it, as in the case of ICSID with the annulment process. And of course you can always have uh, a merits-based review within the arbitration process. But uh, in domestic arbitration, non-international arbitration, it's wide open for review of the merits by the courts and each of the provinces has provided their own legislation. The variety of solutions in each of the provinces is mind-bending. I gotta tell you, I, I have written a paper which I, I'm not gonna generally make available to the conference, but if anyone is interested in it, I'd be happy to give you a copy on, the, on your agreement that you will provide me with some feedback on it. Uh, but um, it contains a paragraph where I summarize the appeal regime in each of the provinces, and I've got to tell you, I have rewritten that paragraph probably about six different times, and every time I get some little thing wrong because it's such a complex picture. Canadian legislation, Canadian Arbitra uh, Commercial Arbitration Act, uh, and the uh, Commercial Arbitration Code, there's no appeal on the merits. Quebec, there's no appeal on the merits. Um, some of the provinces will allow you to opt in uh, to uh, appeals, uh, Nova Scotia and the three territories, for example. In Ontario, if you say nothing, you've got a right to appeal on a point of law uh, with leave of the court. Uh, 
uh, but you can exclude uh, that by agreement. Uh, British Columbia and Alberta, uh, you cannot have a pre-dispute agreement that excludes the right to appeal on a question of law with leave, but post-dispute, uh, and there's a slightly different variation on uh, between the two provinces I don't need to get into. It's a complicated, it's a complicated system. And, uh, but it all has in common the fact that there are these arbitration awards that are burbling up through the court system, and sometimes, um, for example, in the famous Sattva case, uh, the arbitration takes a year, the appeal process takes six, and a, six years. Uh, in another BCNet case, arbitration takes three months. Three months from the time the notice to arbitrate is delivered to the time the award is rendered, and that is then in litigation for an another three years. So here, like, virtually ten times the amount of time is spent in the appeal process than in the arbitration. What was the original idea of going to arbitration? Think about every single reason why you might want to go to arbitration and then think about how that's impacted by an appeal. Confidentiality, out the window. Uh, contain costs, well you're definitely going to have more costs. De uh, expedited proceeding, you're definitely going to have delay and you're going to have a ton of it. Um, so, and you can go uh, choice, of, choice of decision maker, out the window, we're now going to uh, go with whatever uh, some un, as yet unknown judge or panel is going to determine. And is it going to necessarily be right? Well, uh, I've got some examples uh, in my paper, but the best example is Sattva. Uh, here you've got the Court of Appeal uh, saying uh, the result in the arbitration award is absurd, and you have the Supreme Court of Canada saying it's not unreasonable. So think about it. Just do a little thought experiment with me. What if the Supreme Court of Canada had denied leave? So the result would have been the award was absurd. We now know, having had the further uh, appeal, that that would have been the wrong result. Uh, and you can say the same about virtually all of these cases. There's another uh, wonderful example. I think it's a wonderful example uh, that I cite in my paper, uh, the Boxer case, where uh, there, there are something like, I don't know, 15 reported decisions on the appeal from the arbitration award having to do with with uh, leave to appeal up and down, leave to appeal up and down, uh, then the decision on the merits, then you have a decision of the court that doesn't actually decide the dispute or send it back to the arbitrators, then you go through the whole process again over another six years and you come up with a different decision by the arbitrator and you will still have people who say the first arbitrator was right. Second arbitrator happens to be a very good friend of mine and I think he's generally right personally I like, I like the decision of the first arbitrator better. Uh, so uh, what is it all about? The appeal system uh, raises that question. Uh, so I'm just going to conclude with this, and then we can have uh, lots of time for discussion. But um, we've just gone through a process. Um, Angus Gunn was part of it. Uh, Brian Duguid, who's here, was part of it. There are probably others in the audience I haven't identified. Uh, the Uniform Law Conference of Canada uh, went through uh, the Domestic Arbitration Law Project, which reviewed all of the uh, provincial uh, acts and came up with recommendations for a new Uniform Act. The old Uniform Act um, is um, what a number of provinces base their current legislation on back in the 1990s. And um, uh, so the the that domestic arbitration law project had a working group. They came up with a recommended new act, which was just recently adopted by the ULCC, as a matter of fact. And it's a complex document. It uh, probably identifies every single issue, and I think this is the real value of it, is that it probably identifies every single issue that's out there with respect to domestic arbitration. Uh, it's a great compendium of that. But on, in, with, re, with reference to appeals, the recommendation is that there should be no appeals with respect to matters, questions of fact, no appeals with respect to questions of fact, mixed fact and law, appeals on a point of law only if the parties have specifically chosen that so that they have agreed to consciously depart from what arbitration is supposed to be, and um, 
And then in that case, it's directly to the Court of Appeal uh, with leave, so you don't have these intermediate uh, processes. So uh, that was a very controversial provision. It was very hard fought through the ULCC process. Uh, there were slightly more than half of the people involved in the, in the working group who wanted to have no appeals at all. Um, but this was a compromise that was ultimately uh, worked out. And a very interesting thing from an Ontario perspective, and I'll just conclude with this, there's so much more that we can talk about. Uh, but a very interesting thing from an Ontario perspective, you may remember that I mentioned way back when that Nova Scotia and the three territories have legislation that says, guess what, you can only, le you can only appeal if the parties so provide in their agreement. So we're back to that. Uh, and as a matter of fact, where those, uh, that, those bits of legislation were based on the way Ontario law used to be before we adopted the previous um, Uniform Arbitration Act put out by the ULCC. So in other words, in Ontario, with this recommendation, if Ontario were to recommend this, were to adopt this recommendation, it's a back to the future scenario. We would actually going, be going back to the way it was prior to 1991 uh, with the further elaboration that it's now limited to points of law uh, with leave to the Court of Appeal. So um, that's, I just wanted to give you some information about uh, sort of the, the current landscape. Uh, obviously there's um, a lot to debate and a lot to discuss and I do expect that there will be uh, a, a much more discussion before uh, this recommendation is adopted and Personally, I would be very surprised, given the mixed bag of provisions we have now, if indeed uh, we would be able to move towards a uniform uh, arbitration appeals regime uh, in Canada anytime soon. Okay. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, <clears throat> we've been conferring up here, at least Mr. Benny has been expressing the view that we should give the uh, members of the audience the opportunity to comment and uh, ask questions at the same time as we get comments from uh, uh, Bob Armstrong and uh, Ian on Bill's paper. So uh, anybody who wants to be heard, uh, please stick up your hand. Uh, Bill, uh, Ian, you had wanted to say something though. Uh, in response to, uh, to Bill? Uh, yes, well, uh, clearly a lot of very, <coughs> very uh, useful information. Uh, as uh, he concurred with me, the mutual back scratching that goes on in the arbitration community, I absolutely concur with him, except <laughs> uh, he has chosen uh, uh, extremes for his comparison. Uh, the arbitration went through in three months from start to finish. Uh, I don't know how many people here have seen an arbitration go from start to finish in three months, but I suggest they are very few and far between. And then the worst examples in the courts where the thing grinds on for six, seven years. Uh, so I think that the issue really is that there is a complementarity between uh, arbitral work and judicial work. I think there is some merit in the argument that the courts uh, provide a coherent, uh, unified, authoritative mm -hmm. statement of the law. And in the arbitration community, because you have arbitrators who are not bound by each other's uh, decisions uh, uh, taking their own uh, uh, path and you do then achieve a, a level of incoherence which which is not uh, uh, desirable. On the other hand, I certainly agree you can't force people into the courts who don't want to go there and I also agree that the business in England, this controversy over moving stuff in the courts is bad because they want to facilitate going to the court, which as Bob pointed out in the Tom Heinzman case, the losing party is going to grab on whatever opportunity there is to delay the inevitable. Uh, 
uh, it, it, it strikes me that what, you know, where we're at is that arbitration fulfills an extremely valuable, essential function. The courts have to compete on the, in the marketplace. People are going to have to see the court contribution as useful. They're going to have to accelerate uh, the procedures. I mean, when I was on the Supreme Court, we had a case involving prisoners' rights that went from the application through the trial division, through the Court of Appeal, through the Supreme Court of Canada, and a decision all within a week. Now, that is against some of your six-year examples, but it just shows that you know, the courts have to smarten up. It's unacceptable, uh, the delays that are, that are encountered. But it, it strikes me that the argument is not only that arbitration has great strengths, it's an argument that the courts have a lot of reforming to do, and they better get on with it. Oh, uh, I just have a question uh, for Bill. Uh, ten years or so ago, you used to see arbitration clauses uh, which provided uh, often for a right of appeal, uh, for, uh, and one I really like now is to uh, three retired uh, Provincial Court of Appeal judges uh, across the country. Uh, and uh, you d I don't see that anymore. Perhaps uh, the Lord Beaverbrook case uh, killed it. Yeah. I don't know. Well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll say this. When I started to practice law, there were lots of contracts that had arbitration clauses in them. We just never arbitrated those cases. Council would just call up each other and say, well, there's this arbitration clause in, in this contract, you know. We don't want to do that, do we? Uh, so they just blow it away. Um, we would just blow it away. I don't, I don't know whether others have the same experience, but arbitration just was not a popular thing for litigation lawyers to do. And by the way, I'll come back to the comment about when litigation lawyers draft an arbitration clause, as far as I'm concerned, they're more likely to screw it up than the corporate lawyers are because they're going to provide a litigation-like process and they're going to lock it in. Um, and that's anathema to the uh, effective functioning of, of arbitration. So I think, coming back to your question, um, you can provide for internal processes within the appeal. And uh, there are some rules that specifically provide for it. For example, I think ADR chambers, you can get that. And um, there are certain types of arbitration that provide for that. Arbitration place. Uh, arbitration place. Yeah. Has an internal uh, appeal. Right. Or, or you provide right. the service to anyone who wants it, I no, think. No, there are. There's a set of uh, arbitration okay. appeal oh, rules. Okay. So, so there and you go. And they're pretty much perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, so there you go. Listen, I have no problem with consent on, I have no problem with consent, on consent. So yeah. let's start out with a consensual arbitration process, and then we can add whatever appeals we want based on consent, whether it's internal or external. Just don't impose it on anybody. And by the way, and I say this in my paper, I do believe that there are legitimate areas for appeal to the courts. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an extremist in that sense. Uh, one of them is actually raised by the Teal case that's going to be argued in the Supreme Court of Canada on November 1, and that is uh, statutory interpretation. Okay, that's a kind of an interesting point. Uh, standard form contracts, that's an interesting point. Now, I don't think that you should impose a right of appeal in those cases. I think when BC drafts its legislation that says, thou shalt go to arbitration, and it is concerned about consistent interpretation of its statute, then it should say, thou shalt go to arbitration, and by the way, there will be a right of appeal on a point of law. Fine. Now, now you're in the realm I can accept. Interesting footnote. I was talking to a very senior, well-placed um, uh, uh, barrister, uh, in, very active in arbitration, who said that Lord Thomas uh, is now kind of privately explaining his, uh, uh, his uh, remarks by saying what he really had in mind was maritime law and insurance law where there are these contracts out there that are broadly used and interpreted, and British common law has placed an, played an important role in interpreting those instruments. So, you know, there again, my solution to that would be, great, let the parties provide for a right of appeal when that's important to them. And there's always at least one party to those contracts who both has that interest and the ability to control what the contractual language says. That's almost without exception the case. So um, 
you know, it's um, it's not a simple it's not a simple landscape. I think there is a role for consensual appeals even to the court, but it, it shouldn't be universal and it shouldn't be um, imposed. And I think that's where the ULCC uh, ended up. Well, Lord Thomas may now say that now. I've read both both his speeches, and he didn't say one word about uh, specific contracts being the need uh, requiring yeah. more publicity. However, it was implicit. No, it's implicit. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last chance. Uh, has anybody got a, an intervention or comment? If not, then uh, I would like, on your behalf, to thank the panel for their presentations, and thank you for coming. Thank you.